Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 16th R&D session. I am Monica Fernandes from EDP New, and uh, we have been organizing this webinar since last year, and we have been focusing on different uh, different topics that uh, we are working on our projects. Um, and we already talked about uh, different topics like hydrogen, like battery storage, floating offshore wind. And for today's session, we will focus on uh, the power of artificial intelligence for renewables. And um, we for today, we'll plan a really nice session. And um, it will be um, it will be about Sorry, I'm listening another feedback. Um, so I will pass the floor to Inish uh, that will uh, present the session and I wish you all a great session. Thank you. Hi, uh, sorry for technical issues. So our session today is about the power of, for, of AIs for renewables. Uh, we already had uh, an introduction and now uh, I'm going to show you the agenda. Uh, I'm Marie Inês Marques from EDP New and today's session uh, agendas will be about AI where my colleague Ricardo Santos will share some facts about AI, meaning artificial intelligence. And then Ricardo and I will describe Project smart for us this one about data science for renewable energy prediction. And finally, the roundtable, where our invited experts will share with us their vision on the future of renewables uh, energy forecasting. At the end of the session, we'll have a small Q&A session and uh, so that we can clarify your possible questions. You are free to uh, show them uh, at our Q&A uh, to write them at our Q&A uh, area. Uh, and now I'm going to make, I'm going to pass the floor to Ricard. Hello everyone. Uh, so this is uh, a session about AI and the Smart Forage, a project uh, we're working at uh, DPNU, uh, which uh, focuses on data science for renewables. So I'll start with the with the brief history, like a crash history of AI and how it evolved till the present moment. So AI started in about the, the 1960s uh, with the works of some researchers uh, as researchers as uh, John von Neumann, uh, Marvin Minsky. Uh, which started the basis of AI. Then there was this like AI winter where uh, the initial promises of AI weren't uh, delivered. So like uh, uh, people stopped investing in AI, uh, like there was kind of a capital drain from, from this area. Uh, but now we're seeing a, a revival that we hope uh, that keeps on going since this, this is an area which has a, an enormous potential to, to build upon the digital transformation that we're seeing on, on companies and the utilities, uh, energy utilities in particular. So I'll start uh, with the, the what of uh, uh, the, sorry, the when of, uh, of AI. Uh, when, uh, what does, what, why, why do we pose this question? We pose this question because we want to understand why is AI appearing in the, the mainstream field now? This is mainly due to a, a, a big boost in, uh, in the research site, uh, in which there were like, uh, very important developments in terms of, for example, neural networks, neural, uh, uh natural language processing and also uh, on on the side of prediction and we're seeing uh, each day uh, the the prediction on renewables in evolving in a very promising uh, direction so after the when we have uh, another question which is the what of of uh, ai and uh, 
like I said, the what is mainly impulsion by these NLP groups, like the, the articles you see in the media, all the hype around AI focuses on like these uh, extra human uh, AIs that uh, are being built uh, by some companies like OpenAI, like uh, Chinese companies. And these, uh, these models that you see are mainly transformer, transformer models. Uh, so these are models that produce uh, very, uh, very good texts, which, uh, which is near, uh, near, uh, n uh, almost near uh, human, human creation uh, kind of text. But, uh, but it is still, it, these are still uh, mathematical functions. It is not yet uh, a knowledgeable AI. It learn from a huge data set. These data sets are growing from the millions of parameters to the billions of parameters. This also has a, a huge uh, cost in terms of capital and energy. And uh, particular on NLP, the work is being done to, to build more efficient models, which take, uh, which lower the costs and are more energy efficient. Going to the next question that we've posed ourselves uh, to build this session. It's how will these uh, developments go on? Uh, so when when we ask the how, this is mainly how much capital is available uh, for the field. And as you can see from, from this graph here that we've gathered from uh, an AI uh, state of the art of uh, 2020, you can see that there's a lot of capital flowing from like uh, the the private sector starting in 2016 you didn't have like uh, lots of capital you have like 7b going into the to the ai area today we have like around 70b in the area so this is a a, a huge growth now to the to the final question that we've posed ourselves it is the the why now why now? This is uh, this is the I think the most important question because it is also related to the moment that we're living in terms of uh, our uh, public health. Uh, so we have COVID. COVID brings like remote work to to a mainstream panorama, uh, and uh, from here we are forced, uh, not in a bad way. This forced is in a good way because uh, we we adopt. Uh, a higher uh, a higher set of uh, digital tools and these digital tools boost the digital transformation in companies and uh, this boost uh, builds the floor for the the next step of AI which is gather data have uh, good databases to work on and from there on we can see the the AI promises being uh, uh, being delivered through time uh, in uh, in uh, coordination with the uh, with the, the the research that is being done, very good research that is being done in the area. So now uh, we pass to Smart Forest, which is uh, an European project uh, that my colleague Marines is going to, in to introduce, and I hope you like it. So now I'm going to introduce you in the Smart Forest project. Uh, it is a funded project by European Union's uh, 2020 Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. The project Smart Forest is about uh, the next generation modeling and forecasting of variable renewable generation for large scale integration in energy systems and markets. It aims to bring substantial performance improvements to the whole model and value chain uh, in renewable energy forecasting with particular emphasis placed on optimizing synergies with storage and to support power system operation and participation in electricity markets. So it concentrates on a number of disruptive proposals to support ambitious objectives for the future of renewable energy, energy forecasting. Uh, this is thought of in the context uh, with steady increase in the quantity of data being collected and computational capabilities. This comes in combination with recent advance, advances in data science and approaches to meteorological forecasting. Now some key facts. The project started in November 2019 
and it will, it will end in April 2023 and is led by Arminis. EDP is part of the consortium uh, that has 12 partners uh, from six European countries and is composed by end users, researchers and meteorologists. And actually for the roundtable later in the session today, our three invited speakers will present will represent these three types of partners. Uh, we'll have an end user, a researcher, and a meteorologist. And now I'll pass again to my colleague Ricard Sanch that will present you the project uh, Smart Grow has uh, more deeply and the DPU's role in it. Okay, so what is smart for us? The, the, main, the main goal is to apply data science to renewable energy so that uh, we can uh, make better predictions of uh, climate uh, variables, so that we can make better predictions uh, about how we use uh, our uh, storage resources, how we go to the market, how we can, can be better and at making these decisions. Nonetheless, we we don't want to to take the 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 human side from from the loop. We want to keep the the human making the last decision because this is what makes sense. Uh, here, the the data science tools and the AI, the AI tools appear as a, a decision support for the for the the human operator at the end. So the the project vision is mainly to 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 establish uh, a bridge between academia and industry, which is being done by collaborations uh, between uh, companies like HDP uh, and uh, and uh, universities like uh, uh, like Armin, like the 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 Paris University where Armin is uh, situated. Um, and like we 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 are leveraging the the knowledge that these people from uh, academia, which are in front of the state of the art in in uh, AI, uh, are uh, sharing with us and teaching us, and uh, building on top of it, validating some models on uh, on real industrial scenarios like the one we're going to see next in uh, in Kobad in Romania and uh, from our side at EDP new uh, we we had a, a great help from from EDP renewables which uh, which gave us access to to data from the the wind farm in uh, uh, Kobad in Romania um, and uh, yeah this is the this is Romania a picture from the the country uh, which is a very beautiful country by 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 the the picture uh, and the the wind farming in Kobadin it has a system which is uh, a set of uh, of wind turbines which uh, which uh, amount to a total of 26 megawatts uh, the, um, the 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 wind turbine uh, uh, manufacturer was was vested and uh, this, this wind farm has a coupled storage battery of around one megawatt. So uh, what what is the, the goal here? The goal is to take on this battery, which is a small battery for the size of the, the wind farm, uh, and to simulate uh, several scenarios of compensation of deviations between the, the energy generated uh, by the, the wind turbine and uh, for the, the the capacity for the best battery to compensate the the, ener the the energy generated by the wind turbine uh, by the wind turbines related to the bids that we've done on the day ahead to the market, and these bids also depend on on a, on a forecast. Um, so going to the to to the specific work that we've been doing. To the moment, we we took uh, an algorithm which was applied on EDP renewable side. We we wrote that algorithm on Python, and with this algorithm, we got some results and validated that it worked. Um, mainly, what uh, what you can see in the picture 
is that uh, we have these uh, operational energy deviations between the bids that we do to the market and the real time production of energy and the battery is able to enter and compensate uh, a small percentage of these deviations. Um, our goal in the project is to take this approach from EDP renewables. We are already working on a next uh, scenario, taking on, on state of, of the art, um, uh, of state of the art uh, mathematical optimization approaches uh, to, to enhance the, the capability of this model, which is basically a if then model. Uh, based on some constraints of the, the battery plus wind turbine system. And uh, after this, we're, we're going from the base, like taking the basic mathematical approach of mathematical optimization, and then we'll, uh, we'll evolve through these approaches, building on top of the, the first one, uh, better scenarios, uh, more specific scenarios, and then at the end, we'll compare all these scenarios with the machine learning approach, which at the base also has uh, optimization, but she's, it is more kind of a black box optimi optimization, more complex on which we don't have so much control. And it's more difficult to explain than the models that we are building now. Um, and uh, taking on that, uh, we hope to enhance uh, uh, a lot the, the 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 capacity of the battery to to compensate the the deviations between the the energy uh, generation and the the energy bidded to the market, and uh, to compare these different models, what we do is to use a, a very simple uh, KPI which is called, we call it compensation ratio. This is a, a small ratio which uh, relates, uh, we, which basically tells how, how good is this battery compensating the, the, the deviations in the system and gives us a final number, a final percentage, uh, which we can look over different time, uh, time windows. And for example, in this uh, use case that we've tested, for one month of data in the beginning of 2019, we had a compensation factor of 12.5%, uh, uh, which is very low. And we already expected that since uh, the battery is not scaled. Uh, another thing that we can do here is scale the size of the battery uh, in a simulation way so that uh, we try to understand the effects that this has on the on the deviation compensation, which is our main goal here. Uh, yeah, and uh, this deviation compensation uh, work, it's more kind of a, an operational perspective, which will be integrated in a, a multi-objective optimization scenario, uh, which uh, Armin is working on. Um, and uh, this multi-objective will take into account uh, several mar market uh, features to, to optimize uh, the revenues that you get from uh, operating this battery with the wind turbine on the market. Uh, yeah, and so this is it from our side. I hope you liked it. And uh, now I pass the floor to, to Inez and to the to the speakers. Uh, and you can ask more uh, questions about Smart Forest because I'm I'm sure uh, the the speakers can can uh, can give you the answers. Thank you very much. So now for the roundtable, I'm going to present you the three invited speakers. Simon Kamal. Let me first put you in our speakers. Yes, Simon Kamal is project manager of the European Horizon 2020 project smart for s and works in research central per C of Arminis, Mina Paris Tech at PSL, PSL University. He received his PhD on forecasting and optimization of auxiliary services provision by renewables from Mina Paris Tech PLS University in 2020. Laure Renault is a researcher at French National Center of Meteorological Research 
in the numerical weather prediction and the assimilation department. In the Smart Forest project, she, she contributes to the development and utilization of very high resolution rest oriented and civil forecasts. Ana Garcia is the head of Milo office department at EDP Renewables in Madrid. She has several years of experience in energy department management, in particular the sales of electricity and gas products in European centralized markets. And her activities in EDPR includes the supervision and development of advanced analytics based models, specific studies for the quantitative and qualitative assessment of electricity systems regulations and specific topics such as the integration and operation of energy storage in renewable systems. This roundtable will be about the future of renewable energy forecasting and will be composed by several questions addressed to our invited speakers. So not spending now much more time, I'm going to start now by a question to Anna. What are the limits of forecasting we are facing now? Well, answering this question from my perspective of the operation of renewable assets in centralized market, as we say that the main limitation we are facing right now for forecasting is the data availability and the data quality. So sometimes we, we face that we don't have enough, enough historical data from, from public and public resources about electricity system. So that impacts directly on 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 the understanding of electricity market first of all but also it has an impact on the on the training of the models if we don't have enough data to train the models they will not perform as expected and also understanding the market uh, help us to understand the output of the models which sometimes we need to read out before uh, applying into into real operation let's say also regarding the quality and this is very important because sometimes uh, we need to use forecasting variables to, to make some forecasts. So if we want to predict, for instance, the, the imbalance on the system, we know that uh, the imbalance is dependent of the, of, the for of the imbalance of the demand and the renewable generation, for instance. So if we don't have a good prediction of what would be the demand on, in a system and the, in the renewable generation, our model will never perform as expected and the accuracy will, will be greatly impacted. And now going more in detail, now that the markets are moving towards a real time operation now with the continuous intraday market, we, we are we are seeing that we need to operate more close to real time. The cl gate closure is getting uh, really, really close to real time. For that, we are uh, updating our models. We are adjusting them for the real time operation. And for that regard, we need we need to feed those models with real time data and we need to to have access to this real time data, uh, both, uh, especially from public sources that we need that now there is this, this project to gather all data like in, in sources like NSOE. So for us, that is very important to have access to, to that information on time, which is not always the case. And just to add some point, uh, another thing that is not limiting forecasting, but clearly is impact over forecasting performance is the presence of, of volatility in the system, in the markets. No? So this volatility or these big prices that we are seeing in the market and is clearly impacting uh, the operation of renewable resources are coming but unexpected events. And our models are not always capable to predict those events. So that is it's not limited, but clearly is impacted. But if I have to sum up this answer in two, in two questions in one word, I will say data availability and data quality. Thanks, Anna. And for Simon, what are the potentials and limits of forecasting and AI based decision -led tools for the power system of, of 2030 and beyond? Yes, uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you for the invitation to to the webinar. So I, I think I will I will reply by making a link uh, to the reply of, of Anna also. So uh, I will start with the the case of forecasting, and then I will explain a bit more our vision of, of AI, and in particular in the case of uh, the frame of smart forests. So let's say that uh, the potential of of, uh, of forecasting is actually to to reply to some of the challenges that have been raised by Anna. For instance, uh, she mentioned that actually the markets are moving towards intraday, towards real time, and actually, well, we have some we have a good experience in forecasting and renewable forecasting in particular, and we know that we actually have good models that are able to predict the prediction of renewables for the next minutes and up to the next hours. So this is a good first potential for uh, for the forecasting side. So in a, in a broader perspective, I would say that actually a good potential for forecasting is 
uh, it is adaptable to the upcoming evolutions of uh, the power systems and the electricity markets in particular. Uh, we could talk also about the evolution in coming on uh, the role of ancillary services, so you know, uh, frequency containment and so on. So uh, it's actually starting, uh, we see that coming, especially in, in Germany, but I'm sure also in the Iberian market, actually it's, uh, it's becoming quite commonplace now, that uh, renewables, either alone or coupled with storage, actually participate to these services. So here forecasting also has a potential, forecast the prices for these new services. So this is a new revenue opportunity for the renewables, uh, but also all uh, the market quantities that are associated to, uh, to these services. Um, if we uh, don't consider strictly the, the production and the prices, but also the bidding strategies, it's, it's interesting with forecasting models to try to predict the bidding curves of the other participants in the market in order to uh, optimize the strategy. That's also a potential of forecasting. Then uh, what we have seen uh, recently is that forecasting from the R&D offers also uh, some options that can then be uh, used by, by the industry. One example is uh, the hierarchical forecasting, so to be able to have a coherent forecast over uh, all the levels of a hierarchy. Think of a network, for instance. So uh, by using this hierarchical forecast, uh, a network operator could have a coherent prediction of all the uh, renewable prediction in the different levels of its grid, so low voltage, medium low voltage, and so on. And so this is very helpful for him to uh, then optimize its, uh, its management of the grid, of the congestions, of the losses, and so on. Um, and finally, for the potential of forecasting, well, uh, we are developing in Smart Forest some high resolution forecasts of both the production and the weather. And this is obviously very helpful because then, uh, for instance, to provide the ancillary services at, uh, at a very high temporal resolution, so reacting to, let's say, uh, signals at the minute scale, we need this type of forecasts. So these are the potential. Then there are some limits of the forecast. For instance, uh, most of the forecasts provided now are still in the deterministic form, so without quantifying the uncertainty. And obviously, we need to make it more commonplace to have a, a probabilistic form of the forecast. Um, then when we move to very big data problem, then forecasting, the standard forecasting approach, they tend to uh, uh, not to perform so well. Um, so for that, we actually need uh, the AI. It's also true for uh, forecasting the extremes. So it's related to the variability that Anna, Anna mentioned. So in order to, uh, to predict uh, very rare events, for instance, the standard forecasting models, sometimes they, they don't, uh, they are not performant enough, let's say. So what is the potential of AI in two words? Let's say, uh, first, they can simplify the approach because uh, if you still rely on forecast, and if you consider all the different and certain variables, then you need, uh, let's say, one forecasting model for all variables. It becomes very complex. So with AI, you can do directly the decision aid optimization, for instance. So you simplify the model chain. That's very important. Uh, and the second point is that AI is actually uh, able to extract more value than uh, the standard forecasting approach. So especially when you have, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, you have uh, hundred thousand of variables, even billions when managing a grid or uh, you know considering many uncertain scenarios then the ai which can be a standard neural network or something more involved like reinforcement learning learning actually shows to have better performance so they they extract better the value so that's that's really the potential however to to conclude uh, limits of the ai are actually limits that uh, are also shared with the with forecasting so they are very good at when they are trained on on the past but as we uh, we want to prepare 2030 and beyond, then if uh, the market is expected to change radically, then uh, probably these uh, AI tools won't be very helpful because the, the data from the past won't, uh, won't inform us on the future. So for that, we need some models to actually have data on, 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 future, uh, on future designs before even thinking about uh, AI models. And the last uh, limit is uh, the interpretability of the AI. So sometimes it's really complex to understand how AI works. So it's a barrier for, uh, for the implementation of AI. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Simo. Uh, and Laure. Laure, do you think AI will help improve weather forecasts and their utility to rest forecasting? 
Yes, uh, thank you for this question because AI is really a burning topic now for weather prediction. There is a growing interest for integrating uh, AI technologies uh, in uh, weather forecasting and also in application of weather forecast. And uh, where well, I can see very different uh, ways to um, AI methods could be beneficial for weather forecast and the applications. Uh, well, first of all, AI may be used to improve the numerical weather prediction models and uh, especially the representation of uh, subgrid processes such as turbulence, radiation, convection or microphysics, which are key to make good predictions for weather forecasting. And uh, at the present time, these subgrid processes are represented with quite empirical uh, models that we call the physical parameterizations. And there are um, uh, currently several studies showing that AI could be used to uh, significantly improve uh, this parameterization and, and the representation of these subgrid processes. Um, also, I, I would like to mention that uh, AI has long been used um, in with a forecast to improve their quality in a post-processing step that we call the calibration. The idea of the calibration is to learn and then correct systematic errors of with a forecast. And uh, this is done at Meteor France since the 80s. So at the beginning, it was with um, very simple methods like uh, linear regressions, for instance. But uh, now we are looking at uh, more advanced methods such as uh, random forest or neural networks. But just to say that AI is not uh, a new topic, in fact, in weather prediction. And uh, maybe we, uh, we are one of the first domain to operationally use AI for, um, uh, for several years. Um, another application of AI that I can see is for now casting of, uh, of useful quantities for rest forecasting, such as a cloud cover. Um, well, uh, there are several studies showing that uh, cloud cover forecast based on AI at the very uh, short ranges uh, may be better than traditional uh, weather modeling. So there is a, I think uh, this is a way uh, we should look at, in fact, uh, using AI to improve the now casting and so the very first hours of the simulation. And uh, maybe a final point that could be uh, also interesting uh, for AI methods is for the combination of different sources of weather forecast because um, uh, now uh, we have access to a wide variety of weather forecast, including deterministic forecast, ensemble forecast, and also at different uh, spatial temporal scales. And, um, and uh, it, it's clear that a clever combination of these different forecasts uh, will be definitely better than using a single forecast. But now we, we have to, uh, to make a clever combination of these different forecasts. And I, I think AI uh, could be the, uh, a, a good option, a good solution to make, uh, to make this clever combination. Uh, so to conclude, yes, uh, there are different avenues where AI could uh, could be used to improve the forecast at the different spatial temporal scales and also um, uh, in their utilities for rest forecasting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now for N, Anna. How do you see the role of reinforcement learning in forecasting tools for renewables? Thank you for the question. I think that it's going to play and is actually playing an important role in when forecasting it is allowing us to go one step forward. And right now that we are uh, introducing all this automatization in the in the market process and in the bidding process, not only for renewables, but in, all, in every uh, market dispatch. So I think it is playing an important role. And I think it will, I mean, it, it this kind of algorithms are very practical when, when defining market strategies, because maybe with, with a good training of the models and a good parametrization, uh, those kind of algorithms uh, will help us to, to, to design market strategy and, and to define uh, yes, to define market strategy that maybe our human brain are, are, are not capable are not capable to, to design or, or some things in the market that human brains are not capable to capture and maybe this model are, are able to do so. 
but we have, of course, limitation in the development of this model because I think it is very important to have a very, let's say, good tested pla platform in the sense that if we want the models to, to learn from for real actions, we need to 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 feed these models with with good real data. For that, we, for instance, we want to model some some market strategy for for the bidding in I, I don't know an intraday market and to to reduce the the error of win production. We will need to feed this model with real market offers but that are not always available. And also, I think it is very important to comply with with market rules, with with with, with market rules. Yes, and and for that we need to parameterize uh, very very carefully and correctly our algorithms. So I think uh, it will play a, a very important role. It's playing right now a very important role. It will play it in the future. It adds a bit a bit of complex in the in the forecasting because well it is as, as some of my colleagues has high stated before sometimes it is more difficult to to understand the solution of the of the model so it requires us a bit of a bit more of effort and link it with just what I just said it is even though we use these these algorithms to provide a solution that has learned from from let's say for from the past and and we train it with with real market data uh, we will need always traders and um real people to monetize the the output because we need to comply with i mean we, we need to follow the market and even though the we we might think at the beginning and the model knows more, more than us it, it is always required to to, to to have a look to follow up the the results and trying to understand them and for that is as the at the end <laughs> everything is related with data data availability because we know the techniques are there they are continuously evolving and we are we are getting a uh, read of it i mean sorry we are getting information from that for everything that is published regarding this kind of algorithms but of course in order to have a good output a good accuracy a good uh, let's say performance we will need to to have a, a good historical data and and to in order to train the models correctly and, and understand the results. So that will be my answer. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, and Simu, uh, data driven methods can improve operation value, but are usually black, black box. Is it possible to combine improved value and explainability of the method? Yes. Thank you, Ines. Um, so just to uh, to remind us why actually these uh, AI methods data driven approaches are black boxes. There are actually two cases. Uh, a first case could be rather simple methods, but which are put in a sequence. So for instance, you want to uh, forecast a quantity then make an optimization. So already this sequence becomes in itself sometimes a black box because it's it's uh, very difficult to understand the relationship between the, the data that is at the input and the output. So a first uh, type of black box case is this sequence of models. Another point of black box is maybe the one that we think of more is typically these neural networks. So they are really nonlinear functions that are built from the inputs and from the response. And so it's very difficult for us to understand how a little change in the input will impact uh, the output. So these are the two cases that we have to, to consider. Um, and so for these two cases, actually we have solutions. So for the first case, um, so this complex uh, sequence of models, what we can do is to hybridize uh, the data-driven approach with a simple optimization. So it's something we, we try to develop and we, we have good results already in, in smart forest. Um, it's based on the work from the uh, research operational, operational research community. So it's not from the forecasting side, interestingly. And the, the idea is to uh, train a data-driven approach uh, to obtain uh, local weights um, and then uh, these local weights are used by a simple optimization method to optimize the decisions. So uh, this is interesting because uh, you can use the machine learning to effectively uh, learn these local weights based on uh, weather conditions, for instance, and then get an optimal uh, trading decision or grid manage management decision in the end. And this, by doing so, you don't have the sequence anymore. You directly use the data, so weather data, data on the renewable production, market prices, and get at the end your, uh, your trading, for instance. So do, by doing this, it's uh, easier directly to assess the impact of the different data variables on the decision. 
instead of having this long sequence of models. So that's one approach. Um, similarly, for grid management, our colleagues at INESC, so INESC Tech in Portugal, are deriving some sensitivity indices uh, from actually a good standard uh, theoretical knowledge of how the network works and then use the machine learning just to uh, learn how these sensitivity indices will evolve uh, depending on the uncertainty on the renewable production. And so by doing so, uh, they achieve the same results as uh, what could be done with a very complex uh, Endoro model of the network uh, using some optimal power flow, for instance. So by doing this uh, hybridization of simple sensitivity indices and machine learning, they are able to uh, provide the user with a simple output. So these sensitivity indices that everyone can understand, uh, but tackling at the same time the capacity of the, of the machine learning. And then the other approach for the, the neural network is a bit more complex. So one, one thing we do in the project is try to validate the, the neural networks uh, so to understand how they actually uh, behave in practice. So uh, one way of doing this is to actually compute, uh, for instance, a grid management problem uh, on one side with the neural network and on the other side with a complex uh, uh, power system validation model. And so uh, once you calibrate the neural model with the complex model that everybody knows, then you have a good understanding of why the neural network gives a uh, a given answer and so you can go back to the let's say model twin of the neural net and finally the other approach but it's more difficult is to actually uh, modify the structure of the neural network so that they can be interpreted so it has been done in the convolutional neural networks for instance and there are some higher level low trl i would say works ongoing on how to understand how we we think as humans so how we reason and reuse this concept in order to make simple networks for humans to understand and use. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and now for Lor. The prediction of weather extremes, like temperature, wind, uh, rainfall, matters for RES. However, it remains difficult to get good forecasts of such events. What are the main obstacles to improve the prediction of extremes? So, yes, you're right. The prediction of extreme weather events is still a very challenging task. And, um, but but we, there are several uh, avenues to improve the prediction of, uh, of such events. So, first one would be to improve the spatial resolution of weather forecasts. So, uh, it's important to know that uh, the currently, uh, our currently finest weather model at Meteor Funds has a spatial resolution of one kilometer. And uh, in the next decade, we plan to develop higher resolution models with uh, ectometric resolution, like uh, 100 meters resolution. And uh, this will, uh, this should strongly improve the realism of the predicted events, and especially the representation of extreme weather events. And uh, it's also good to know that uh, within the Smart Forest project, there are such a very high resolution forecasts that have been run by uh, by WIFOR, uh, with um, with uh, with very very fine uh, very fine spatial resolutions. Uh, a second point to improve the representation of extreme weather events uh, will be to make better use of uh, weather observations. And by better use, I mean uh, develop uh, better data assimilation schemes, but also maximize the use of currently available observations, and uh, also develop the use of um, of new observing systems derived from for instance, from the Internet of Things. Um, and uh, my next point is that uh, to improve the representation of uh, extreme weather events, we should uh, strongly encourage the use of uh, probabilistic forecasting instead of the more classical uh, deterministic forecasting. And uh, so the aim of probabilistic forecasting is to estimate the probability distribution of the atmospheric state. And um, uh, we, for, for that purpose, we use ensemble forecasts. Uh, that means uh, different, uh, different simulations for the same um, forecast location and time. 
And uh, the idea is that uh, we, we try to sample the probability distribution of the atmospheric state. And uh, the advantages of, uh, of this approach for extreme weather events is that these events uh, traditionally lie in the tail of the distribution. So we need this approach of ensemble forecast to properly capture extreme events. Otherwise, deterministic forecasts have difficulties to, uh, to, to approach the state of the distribution. And uh, the, the main limitations uh, nowadays with uh, ensemble forecast is their limited size. We, uh, we generally use between 10 or 20 forecasts to sample uh, a wide probability distribution so that we have difficulties to, uh, to properly sample the tails of the distribution and then the extreme events. So in the, in the, in the next years, we want to, um, to work on extending uh, this method and uh, and develop larger ensemble, uh, ensemble forecasts to, to have a better representation of these distributions and the extreme events. Uh, so yes, there are uh, many obstacles uh, to, uh, to a good representation of extreme weather events, but there are also uh, several solutions uh, to improve the representation of these events. And, uh, and we will strongly work on, uh, on the different solutions in the next years to uh, to improve our forecast of, uh, of these events. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, I have now another question to Anna. How do you see the use of forecasting tools, both for renewables and markets, for the development of battery applications? Well, I think, well, First of all, battery application and installing uh, the, the installation of a storage facility, both collocated and standalone, is 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 providing a lot of flexibility for renewable assets and also for 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 the grid. Uh, I think that this this combination, I think Ricardo stated before, it's it play it is like a perfect match because the 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 design of these algorithms are a key a key a key factor in the performance of the battery. So let's say in the in the profitability of a of a of a of a battery installation and and, the, and not only economically speaking but also in the in the technical performance. So so I think uh, the performance of as I said before the, the performance of a, of every application of every algorithm uh, in this case well they are app application uh, depends on how how we I mean the the inputs that we provided and also how we parameterize the application but. I think that if we if we get, I mean, if we get with result with our forecast, both for the wind, for instance, for the for the example of a of a collocated battery uh, like the one on Comadi, no, which we have a, a wind farm and a and a battery installed uh, within the meter uh, behind the meter of the of the wind farm. Um, in that sense, it is very important to to optimize the 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 use of the performance of the battery is, is very important to count with a good forecast of a good wind forecast no and also to if we if we are using a market application for the battery like the reduction of the of the imbalance of the system like Ricardo explained before but also the reduction of the sorry the provision of ancillary service it is very important to have to to feed the the algorithm of the battery with a good forecast uh, of the market and also on the of the wind generation so if we if we give very accurate information to, to the algorithm we will optimize the performance of the battery both economically and and technically, for instance, if we know how is going to be the price for the or with, for the for the next hour perfectly with the real time price, and we know how it's going to be the the forecast, we can more or less predict uh, what is going to be the imbalance, and therefore we can we can um, we can uh, provide that information to the to the application, and we will move the 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 energy that that provides the most the most uh, let's say a profitable solution in terms of energy move. And an and, and energy save, uh, sorry, and an economical savings, no, for the for the imbalance. So that at the end will will bring a lot of benefits for the profitability of the battery and for also for the technical, uh, for the technical behavior of the battery. Because if we optimize this, the number of uh, daily cycles, we, at the end the duration of the of the life of the battery will be longer. So I think it is a perfect match and forecasting it is it is helping us in the operation not only of renewable assets but also but also on the on the battery. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Simo, 
what are the benefits of the improved forecasting solutions developed in smart forests for end users of the energy industry? Yes, thank you, uh, Maria Agnes. Um, so uh, for sure, uh, improved uh, forecasting solution, uh, we want them to have impact on either uh, trading uh, market applications, let's say, or, or grid management. And this is what we want to uh, to achieve in, in this project in Smart Forest. So actually, we have uh, defined some targets uh, in terms of uh, performance indicator to, to, to achieve, to make sure that we achieve sufficient improvement compared to the existing solutions. So for instance, uh, using the uh, this solution of machine learning and sensitivity indices, um, are we able to uh, reduce the cost of, uh, of congestions, uh, of voltage constraints uh, of, uh, let's say, 10, 15%, uh, something like that. And the same for trading. Are we able with uh, AI versions of, of forecasting tools, for instance, to reduce the forecasting errors by the same amount, 10, 10 15 percent, especially in challenging weather conditions. And if you reduce forecasting errors in on the production level of renewables, then you have good confidence that this translates also in better, in better uh, trading uh, outputs, revenues. Um, I would I would just uh, point out a few, uh, let's say. Uh, Promising areas of uh, of value for the industry. The first one is the value of this of the weather forecast. So all, all the forecast that uh, that Law mentioned previously. So the, the high resolution weather forecast. It actually translates in value. Um, we have seen, for instance, uh, one uh, one output of the project is a very local uh, forecast of the solar irradiance based on the regional network of sky cameras. And this is very promising because it uh, actually um, helped uh, reduce the prediction error of the photovoltaic production on, on, on the rooftop PV from 12% root mean square error to 8% root mean square error for partly cloudy days. So a significant reduction in the forecasting error. Why? Because we actually used information of the how the clouds are moving in a very refined uh, way in, in the scale of, uh, let's say, uh, 100 meters and their impact on the ground. And so this directly translates further to either a better trading revenue if you trade this PV production or an easier way to uh, uh, manage the distribution grid, for instance. Um, so then uh, lower costs. Um, we also uh, observe the same thing when uh, using uh, Additional data sources. Think of uh, a typical case is uh, thunderstorms. So when there are thunderstorms coming, it's very difficult to predict the PV production. So here, uh, by using a new data source that were not used in commercial versions, our um, uh, um, an industrial provider of, uh, of forecasting services actually reduced significantly its uh, forecasting error in the third thunderstorm condition. And this also uh, improve the revenue because these are typical days where you make uh, big errors at the aggregated level of, of a PV portfolio, for instance. Uh, speaking of aggregation, I mentioned the hierarchical forecasting. Um, so this actually has, has the potential of really uh, reducing largely the, the prediction errors by uh, both having a coherent um, prediction of the total output of, let's say, a virtual power plant, which uh, integrates renewables, but also could be a flexible load, for instance, and uh, having a coherent forecast of this total offer, but also of the individual uh, offers, um, the individual uh, production of each uh, production site. And this helps preparing the dispatch of, of the offer in real time. Uh, and lastly, uh, let's say that what is coming in terms of improved forecasting for value is, uh, I would mention two things. The first uh, is a different approach of forecasting. So instead of tuning forecasting to reduce the, the standard error, so root mean square or the absolute error, you could directly tune the model to optimize the value. So you actually train the model on a different function. For instance, on a function which represents the cost of the market directly. It's still a forecasting model, but you tune it directly to uh, fit uh, the penalties on the market, let's say. And this is actually working. We have proved that it's this way of uh, having a value-oriented forecasting improves the revenue of a renewable uh, virtual power plant. 
And finally, uh, what's coming also is collaborative forecasting. So using the data sources coming from any type of site which is nearby your production site, renewable production site, so weather information, recent production, um, and when you use that, you reduce the error. It's uh, spatio-temporal forecasting that we know, but it, co it can go even further. You can then think of developing a data market, so you exchange the data to your neighbors. This data has a value because it helps reducing the error. So first you uh, improve your revenue on the regular energy market by having lower error for yourself, but you also sell your data to your neighbors. So you have two streams of, of revenue, energy and data. And this is very promising for uh, for the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, now, before addressing the questions from the audience, we have another last question. This one for Laura. Uh, future effort is required to help REST partners incorporate the inherent uncertainty of weather into their decision making. What are the current practices to address weather uncertainty? Sorry, Laura, I, I believe you are unmuted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so thank you for the question. It's a very important point. And uh, it's now well known that weather forecasts, despite the regular improvements, are still imperfect and uncertain. And, um, I think quantifying this forecast uncertainty is a very important step that can have a strong impact on the decision process for a majority of end users. And uh, so, so the best way to estimate this forecast uncertainty is by using probabilistic forecasting instead of uh, the classical deterministic prediction. So I, I started to, to mention this probabilistic forecasting in, the, in my previous question. And uh, for almost 30 years now, this probabilistic prediction is implemented uh, as an ensemble of uh, forecasts that comprises multiple realizations for a single forecast time and location. And uh, these different realizations are generated for the perturbation uh, of different components of uh, the weather forecast, uh, including, for instance, perturbation to the initial conditions or to the weather model. And uh, so thanks to this uh, ensemble of forecasts, we can have an idea of the different possible evolutions of the atmospheric state, so the different possible scenery. And uh, we can also compute the probability that a given um, event will occur, or we can compute uh, statistics such as uh, percentiles, for instance. So the idea of this probabilistic forecasting is, is, uh, is really to um, have an estimation of the probability distribution of the atmospheric state. And uh, I would like to mention that uh, the use of this ensemble forecast is really at the earth of the Smart Forest project. Uh, for instance, at Meteo France, uh, we, for, for the needs of, uh, of the Smart Forest project, we have run a very high resolution uh, ensemble forecast over the Euro European domain. And uh, so the forecast then will be used by, by the rest partners involved uh, in the project. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Now about the questions from the audience. We have a question uh, that I believe that's more uh, directed to Anna, but uh, everyone, every of our invitees are, are uh, most welcome to respond as well. And it is uh, beside the topic about historic data cannot be used when they are changing in the market. What is the average error that you can get that you get on doing generation? Well, I'm going to answer the question from the perspective of an end user of a wind forecast. OK, so I would say that I not a. a we don't predict directly the wind, but we receive the wind forecast from our individual wind assets and also for the whole uh, countries where we are operating the markets. So we just, of course, wind plays an important role in, in our models and in our final performance. The, the, the wind error at the end is driving most of the European system in terms of energy imbalance and also, of course, as a wind generation a company, uh, of course, it also drives our, our economical performance. So we monitor it very closely. And what I can say is that 
the the average error of the of this of this forecast is very dependent on the geography and also of the load factor of the of the wind we are expecting. For instance, when we expected a lot of wind in the system, usually forecasts are are more accurate on that wind regimes. So in that sense, when we we expect a high wind penetration, usually uh, we 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 shouldn't expect very uh, very large errors. However, under very low very low load factors, uh, we see that the the errors uh, spike up. So so we see how how we 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 should expect that the 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 wind generation clearly uh, are very, is very different from the from what it was expected. And also, I I will say that it also depends on the geography. So we we have present in some countries where where the given where the wind where the wind farms are located and the typography of the of the area and also the the presence of unexpected uh, meteorological events. I not expected. I not an expert in this topic, but I, I we 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 know that because of this kind of 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 aspect, the the wind forecast is. Uh, um, is clearly impacted. So we have, so just to sum up, we we are, we have geographies where the wind error is around 20%, which is not very high. It's usually normal for for a wind forecast, but we have some other areas where the total error some days reaches the the 40, 45%, which is a lot. So it is not something that I could give just a single answer. It is clearly dependent on, on the topics I said before. But I, if I have to give a number, it is between 20, 40%. We 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 clearly prefer the 20, but we know that there are situations when wind wind forecasting errors can get I mean can be very very large. Oh yeah, that's impressive. And. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the other invitees would like to, to comment something. Yeah, maybe I can comment from the, the forecasting. So we do forecasting as a, of renewable uh, as an academic. We also provide it for some demonstration projects. Um, so what I can say generally, well, I, I agree with Anna first of all. So the, the geography is very important, obviously, because uh, the first uh, data source that you use to build a, a prediction uh, model for, for a renewable is uh, the weather situation. So weather forecasts typically for day ahead uh, horizons, which is very important for the trading. Uh, for the most, uh, let's say, intraday decisions, uh, um, let's say shorter horizons, then it's more the recent productions or recent weather observation that are useful. Um, what we can say is that the forecasting error increases with the horizon, so it's obviously easier to forecast some minutes ahead than uh, 48 hours ahead. Um, in terms of uh, error range, it's very variable, so uh, uh, we usually uh, monitor the error of the deterministic, uh, so without uncertainty with the uh, root mean square error. So uh, I think that a uh, large wind farm with steady winds condition uh, for the intraday can have a uh, uh, RMEC error range of, let's say, I don't know, a few percent, uh, five percent in average. But then uh, obviously for the 48 hours uh, ahead horizon, so typically the end of the day ahead, uh, we are uh, on the average root mean square or, uh, around uh, the 10, 15 uh, percent. But this uh, again depends a lot on the on the conditions. Offshore wind is also uh, in general easier to, to forecast compared to, to onshore, obviously. Uh, yeah, so that's what I can say. But mostly, what I would say, uh, rather than you know absolute figures, what good practice that we do is first to compare your model with some uh, naive benchmark. So the persistence model, for instance, you just take the the last available value and you you check if you do better. And if you have another model than than yours, uh, which is validated in the research literature forecasting, you use that also as a reference to 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 be sure uh, on uh, you know what how you compare. And uh, there are a lot of uh, forecasting competitions now that also help the end users understanding a bit what is the expected range of performance. Obviously, this is different from uh, operational practice due to and we're back to the data quality that uh, that Anna mentioned in the beginning. Yes, and just to add to what uh, Simon was mentioned that the, the, the values estimation I said before it was like the, the absolute error for a period of time and from the day ahead forecast. You, of course, when, when we get closer to real time, the forecast get much much more better. That's why we 
we encourage the participation in intraday markets because we know that there the scheduling gets more easier and we, we can we have more accurate predictions so we we will increase our our performance we, i mean we will improve our performance in terms of energy imbalance and and forecasting errors so just to just to clarify that point <laughs> thank you thank you thank you both uh, i believe ricardo my colleague ricardo has a quick question as well uh, yeah, just uh, a question uh, to close here the session. Uh, it, this question, uh, I think it's more directed to, to Simo. Uh, do you think that uh, including uh, knowledge representation, a field of AI which is not so so talked about, on on these uh, models like neural network models and also some classification models, do you think that it would uh, improve prove the the prediction capabilities of the models in unknown scenarios where even where you don't have uh, a lot of data uh, yeah it's an interesting question actually um, and there are there are cases even if you don't speak of AI where uh, you you actually when you don't have data <laughs> you need to <laughs> replace data with something else so what you can do with the when you don't have so much data so it can be either no data at all. So think of, for instance, if you want to guess uh, what are the, the individual bidding curves of your uh, competitors in the market, you don't have access to this data. The only thing you know is the aggregated total bidding curve of the market. So what you can do is try to model the individual curves of the participants with some variables. And you try then to, uh, let's say, reverse engineer the total curve so that these uh, models of the individuals actually fit the result. So that's uh, even without AI, it's something very interesting, powerful that you can do. Obviously, you are based on assumptions, on uh, hypotheses, but if you have some knowledge on uh, what could be uh, the, the bidding curve of, of some uh, participants, then actually it, quite, it works quite well. And uh, if you consider the case of where you have some data, but the data is scarce, for instance, uh, Think of the prediction of extremes. It can be extremes of uh, load consumption or rest predictions. In that case, actually, it's quite commonplace and useful to use also here an a priori knowledge representation. So try to uh, um, use from uh, um, any any kind of uh, available studies on the distribution of the of the uncertain variables. So you use the best. Uh, what's to your knowledge the best representation of the distribution of the extreme keys so a very long tail for instance or a short one depending on the, the type of phenomenon that you have and you use this distribution to fit your model and this is actually usually better than just uh, running a standard uh, uh, forecasting model based on uh, on the usual regression which will uh, which will be lost and i'm sure uh, with uh, using ai then you can uh, go to another level, but this uh, I think it remains to be to be studied more in detail. Thank you, Simo. And uh, I believe this is the end of our questions. And thank you all for being present. It was very interesting. Uh, I know best the floor to Monica, but you are muted. Sorry, Monica. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you all. Uh, I think it was a great session full of interesting, interesting content. And that's especially because uh, due to the presence of our guests. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, to our guests, to Anna, to Laura and to Simone. Uh, it was really good. Thank you for your availability and for your time and for sharing uh, your knowledge with us. Uh, secondly, I also want to thank to Marie Inez and to Ricardo uh, for organizing the session and for uh, for your presentations. And finally, ob obviously, I want to thank to for our attendees for being here and for following us in every webinar. Uh, next uh, next month we will not uh, have any webinar because it's a, a holiday period. But in September we come back again in the beginning of September with uh, another webinar in another energy topic. Uh, so stay tuned to to know when it is. Uh, and uh, that's all. Thank you all for your presence and uh, have a great afternoon. Bye bye. <laughs>